I don't want to interrupt uh, your meals, but I guess I'm doing that. Um, it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to introduce our luncheon speaker. Um, many of you, I'm sure, if you read the newspapers, will have heard of Larry Krasner, uh, who was elected DA um, of Philadelphia uh, just last November, uh, sworn in on January 2nd of this year. He has been one of Philadelphia's most outspoken and highly regarded progressive attorneys. Um, and then he became DA uh, and got himself right in the hot seat. So he's been, um, I think we could call him fairly a national figure, a, a test case of how a prosecutor or a DA can move from position of public defense with very strong, uh, fierce ideas about justice um, into a position where he's um, really directing um, policy and treatment in the, the justice system for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in one of America's biggest cities. Uh, you can read Larry's um, bio in your packets. Um, he's going to speak for about 15, 20 minutes or so, and then he's going to take questions. And I think it'll be, uh, you'll all enjoy and learn a lot from um, his talk. So, Mr. Krasner, please join me in welcoming DA Larry Krasner. All right, well, thank you for having me. It was not so long ago I would have not only been unknown but thrown out of places like this. Uh, but I am happy to be here even among a bunch of journalists. So I understand the topic is to talk essentially about jail, crowding. I don't want to say overcrowding in light of the last speakers. Um, but I'm going to do a little more than that. I'm going to challenge you because I think, frankly, it's important to challenge journalists, at least as a profession, who might like to think they're simply observing what happens with criminal justice, but in, in many ways are drivers in criminal justice and have been for a very, very long time. For those of you who are not aware, and I'm sure many of you are, there is a history of yellow journalism at its worst uh, in which an increase of, in homicides of X was greeted with an increase in homicide reporting of 7x, and that was because it sold papers. I, you know, I've actually read all of your bios, skimmed a few of them, but I read all the rest of them, and I, and I understand that I'm dealing with an unusual group of journalists here. I understand uh, not only by virtue of many of your being in rural papers or smaller papers, uh, a lot of your being fairly young in your career, that you are a different brand of journalists than the ones that I sometimes encounter in a big jurisdiction like Philadelphia, which is not only the sixth largest city, it has the fourth largest police force and has a tradition of no accountability among the police that is um, frankly shocking. It is also of the 10 largest cities, the poorest, and until recently the one that had the highest level of jail incarceration. So I'm talking to you in a different way and frankly, with a lot more hope than I'm talking to some of the journalists that I deal with in Philadelphia, but I am gonna challenge you because I think it's worth it. I'm here today with the Honorable Carolyn Engel Temin, who's in the back wearing a matching suit. She and I have a band. Um, she is one of the first assistants. Judge Temin was the first woman public defender in Philadelphia. She was one of the first women to be district attorney in Philadelphia when Arlen Specter was Philadelphia's district attorney. Uh, she also served briefly under District Attorney Ed Rendell, someone else you may have heard of, who at 35 became District Attorney in Philly. She was a judge of the highest trial court in Philly and dealing in criminal matters, especially homicides, for 29 years. And since that time has done international human rights judging and adjudication around the world. I got real lucky when she agreed to be one of my two first assistants because I think she brings a breadth of experience and balance that has been sorely lacking in Philadelphia. Um, now, before I decided to run as someone who had never run for office before, and the press immediately reported that it was, quote, hilarious, unquote, uh, and that I was a, quote, unicorn, unquote, <laughs> which was A, true, uh, but really truer to the press than it was to the voters. 
before I decided to do that, I was an attorney for 30 years in Philly, five years as a public defender, 25 years in private practice as a civil rights and criminal defense attorney. And one of the main groups I defended was protesters. It was the defense of free speech activity when the district attorney of Philadelphia County arrested them, which the district attorney of Philadelphia County loved to do for a lot of reasons, usually having to do with politics, because mostly what controls DAs in Philly has been politics. Um, and so I have a profound respect for free speech, and I was actually dumb enough to do that work for free, which means that my financial sense is somewhat akin to yours. Uh, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, a risk-taking approach to life, but uh, you know, I respect the fact that that's exactly what all of you do. Uh, some of this respect for free speech comes from the fact that my dad was a writer and that he, his entire career was spent as a writer. He was a journalist at times. He was a freelance writer. He was an author. Uh, represented by William Morris, major publishers in fiction, which was, yes, you guessed it, crime-related. Um, actually got his degree in writing from Columbia on the GI Bill while living in Harlem. So not too far from here. So I actually think it's OK to be a writer. I even think it's important to be a writer. And I understand a little bit about your plight, which is that it's hard to write true things all the time when power doesn't want you to do that and doesn't want to give you the information you need to do that. It's hard to do that when everybody's watching your work for its quality and your resources are limited. And the truth is that that's only half your problem, because the other half of your problem is that you need to sell, or at least some of you, need to sell nuance and balance to your own editors, many of whom are convinced that comic books sell papers and they sell the media, and that nuance and balance don't, which of course explains why one day I am the savior of Philadelphia and the next four days I am the devil destroying Philadelphia, and it's the same journalist who has written those five pieces for the same paper. Yellow journalism dies hard in some places, and frankly, it's thriving in many, so, um, you know, if, when I look around Philly and look at some of the, some of the journalists I've really respected in the last few years, they may be names known to you, but if they're not, I encourage you to take a look because I know that you all care about these things. Dan Denver, D-E-N-V-I-R, who was through Philly. Um, Samantha Melamed, now. Philly has done some really excellent writing specifically about prison overcrowding, about the interesting phenomenon of collar counties in Philly that have crime rates that are very low through the floor, and yet the DAs are driving up the jail population almost as quickly as they can, of the phenomenon of certain uh, county politicians in the farther flung counties, which are the homes of state prisons, who are trying to introduce bills that, that do not permit the closing of a jail for at least a year, so that there can be a study about that closing of jail. Needless to say, these jails have become mainstays of some of the rural counties' economies in, in, in places where coal no longer uh, supplies that economy. They have built a monster, and they do not want to dismantle the monster because of all the things that you already know about what it has, what effect it has not only in simple dollars, but what effect it has in terms of political power due to how census is counted, and I'm sure you're all aware of that, from John Pfaff and various other people. So really great reporting done by them, and I'm sure really great reporting done by you. So now that I'm done, you know, challenging and flattering all of you, why don't we actually talk about what I came here to say, which is what are the ways that a DA, at least, or a city that is thinking about what to do about a DA can reduce a county population. Philadelphia, not so long ago, had 10,000 people in its county jails. There were essentially four primary county jails. Today, it has 5,000. Um, it had 8,000 only about three years ago. It has actually, it was such a bad location, being the most incarcerated of the 10 largest cities, and having a, a, the average period of time from commencement of a case until its conclusion in Philadelphia County, having had four times the national average as the period of time it took to resolve those cases, it was so bad that we won the booby prize and the MacArthur Foundation came to town and put some money into trying to help us reduce that jail population. I'm happy to say I didn't have anything to do with that increase other than arguing case by case against it as I represented individual defendants four and five days a week in court. But that's where it was. It was at 10,000. And then when MacArthur came to town, it was at 8,000. It just went under 5,000 for the first time in, in probably 20 years at least uh, last week, and is barely above 5,000 today. Um, so we have had some success 
And in particular, there has been success since January the 2nd, because this administration has only been in power now for, for six months. We've had some su success since January the 2nd due to some pretty controversial and frankly, I think, successful policies in trying to deal with mass incarceration. So let me tick off about 15 things that I believe can have a profound effect on what happens with levels of incarceration at the county or at the jail level, let me put it that way. Number one, you gotta decline charges, both on an individual and a categorical basis. We are not prosecuting marijuana possession anymore in Philadelphia County. There is a, a civil ticket, pay a couple dollars, it's over, it's like a parking ticket that exists, but w this administration came in, we got rid of the last of the marijuana possession cases. Philadelphia until recently, and maybe even now, was the second worst county in the United States for opioid overdoses, and there's quite a bit of evidence that the presence and availability of marijuana reduces the number of opioid overdoses. Uh, we have four people dying every day in Philadelphia from drug overdoses, and if you look at some of these studies, you can see as much as a 25% reduction in those deaths. No, we're not gonna prosecute people who possess marijuana, especially in a state that has medical marijuana, so that more people can die. I don't think that's complicated. We can also decline charges based upon specific facts. For example, we had a case where some uh, public transit officers had an incident with a drunken person on a platform brought, were trying to get us to bring charges against the person on the platform for what that person had done, which was supposedly an assault. Only problem with that is the video showed something else, which is that he was obnoxious and loud but never took a swing and his nose was broken and he was concussed by one of the SEPTA officers. Instead, we charged the officers, okay? In charging, if you have access to the information, then you can avoid bringing charges where there's no basis. So first thing that you can do is to actually decline charges where it is appropriate. Of the 10,000 juvenile petitions that used to be brought in Philadelphia, which produced a hell of a school to prison pipeline, we are down to about 2,000. I didn't do any of that, but some very smart people in the police department who saw how valuable it was to stop taking every minor infraction in school and turning it into a criminal case brought that about, and that is an achievement. Going from having 70,000 cases a year in Philadelphia County to a number that's more like 45,000 can make a diff big difference at, at many different levels. So decline charges. Divert more. Put more things into diversionary programs. Don't come up with artificial obstacles. Here's an artificial obstacle. I used to be on first DUIs. If you were an immigrant and therefore you were prohibited by law in Pennsylvania from having a driver's license, you couldn't get in. Really? Why? It's illegal for you to have it. What's the big deal? So you expand it. You expand the provisions that allow people to get in and maybe you require more of those people so that there is a level, of, uh, so there is a level playing field. But you expand it. Here's, here is another example. We have a lot of cases in Philadelphia involve opiates and, involving opiates and opioids provide more pathways for people to get drug treatment and thereby end their cases without having actual convictions. Another possibility, bail reform, get away from cash bail. Now this is a policy that we came with on February the 15th, 45 days into the administration. Uh, Pennsylvania is not gonna pass what DC passed, a law requiring that cash not be part of bail. That's never happening. The bail bondsmen, as someone else said here, are sucking the life out of people, and they are powerful in Pennsylvania, so we're not gonna get that legislation. But what we can do at the local level is that the district attorney can make recommendations because DAs have a lot of discretion. And so we found a category of 26 offenses that are really not violent offenses, and they are not sex offenses, where ordinarily the bail was only $1,000 or less to get out. That is what the history of the setting of bail showed in Philadelphia County. As we examined them, it became clear that the only people who don't get out on $1,000 bail are the broke ones. Everybody else who has a job, middle class, working class, or rich, is getting out. So why not take this category of 26 offenses and make it a presumption that there will be no cash involved? There could be some other conditions, reporting, checking in, et cetera to the extent there's an infrastructure, but we don't need to make money part of it because it was just warehousing people at 135 bucks a day because they couldn't pay 500 bucks to get out. Not good for the taxpayers, not good for them. What did we find? Well, they're going to court, and we have very significant reductions in our jail population. We took a period of 45 days before 
we brought this policy about and 45 days after. And this policy was also linked to a guilty plea policy that I'll mention in a minute. And what we found was that with all the good efforts of the MacArthur Foundation and the city to reduce the jail population, it was dropping six a day before our policies went into effect and it was dropping 13 a day after our policies went into effect. So there's no question that there's an impact and there's no question that the impact is significant. At this time, right now, we have an empty jail in Philadelphia out of four, which was expected, but it was expected in two years, and we have it today. Okay, let's see. We already talked about that. What about um, when we talk about reducing charges, if you look to Illinois, for example, they have what Pennsylvania has, a system in which retail theft the first time is a summary offense, the second time a misdemeanor, the third time a felony. Do you need it? We decided we didn't. Illinois decided they didn't. Yes, in individual situations, people who game the system, they can have their felony. You know, this is not supposed to enable criminal activity, and so we have targeted people like that. But what you find is for the vast majority of people, the utility of charging the higher charges and giving them those convictions and tying up the system with probation and parole and making it harder for them to get employment when they're probably either broke have mental health issues or have a drug problem is simply not there. So we have taken a whole category of cases that used to be misdemeanors and felonies and we simply charge them as summary offenses and the system moves along well. There is no increase in theft in Philadelphia. The result of all these people getting out of jail is a reduction in homicides. It is a reduction in rapes. It is a reduction in armed robbery. Shootings are up 4%. Everything else in the violent category is down. Along, among the property offenses, the bottom line is it's a 0% change, despite these modifications. So it turns out that when you let some of the zombies out of jail, they're not really zombies. And they don't actually set the city on fire, and they don't run out your front door and run out the back door with your loved ones. It turns out that it doesn't have this kind of a direct effect. And I say that with some glee, because that's what I heard during the whole campaign, was that the city would be aflame, there would be a zombie inv invasion, because Krasner and his people are letting people out of jail. What else? All right. So let's talk about pleas. We have this thing in Pennsylvania called the sentencing guidelines. Judges do not have to follow them, but they must consider them for sentencing. And you might think that they were carefully made by a bunch of criminologists who've studied everything for decades to make sure that it's going to be sound criminal justice policy. Well, no. They're actually a mathematical average of what 66, or maybe more than 66, wildly culturally different counties have done over a period of time. Pittsburgh and Philly are not the same as Carbon County. And I say that with no disrespect to my friends from Carbon County. But they are not the same. And so what happens when you take a city of 1.6 million and you consider its sentencing practices to be on the same level of a city that has 10,000? And you average what they're doing in the city of 10,000, where most of the offenses are hunting-related, or maybe it's a prison assault, and you average that with what's happening in a real urban environment like Philadelphia, you're going to find that the sentencing guidelines go up a little bit, because they're not even weighting it for your population. Okay? So what happened back in the 80s is we got these wonderful sentencing guidelines that basically told us how to average stuff. And instead of their improving what happened in Pennsylvania, while the whole country was engorging itself on a 500% increase in, in, in custody, Pennsylvania was setting a standard by engorging itself on a 700% increase. Being a simple person, I therefore conclude these sentencing guidelines are a bad thing and that they are not making things better because we don't actually want to be at 500% or 700%. We'd like to be somewhere down near what used to look like normal. So the policy that we passed is for offenses that are not sex offenses and not violent offenses, and I know that's a longer talk, but for those types of cases, my DAs are presumptively to offer something below the bottom end of the sentencing guidelines. Duh. I mean, what is complicated? If you got some kind of goofy math program that don't work, that really doesn't do anything but set in concrete the gut practices and decisions of a bunch of judges who weren't resorting to science anyway, why would you? So that's what we did, and yes, that along with the bail policies, especially in the jail context where we all have to recognize these are not the most serious offenses. If you are getting sentenced to 11 and a half to 23 months or less, which is what it means to be in jail in Pennsylvania, these are not the most serious offenses. Yes, it causes a significant reduction in that population. 
Mandatories. I don't like them. My wife is a judge. She's been a judge for 17 years. I've been around a lot of judges for a long time. It's basically a lot of non-lawyers telling judges what they should do. Sorry, I'm not feeling it. Seems to me if we're going to pay these judges all this money, we should let them judge. I mean, in Pennsylvania, they are elected. If you're going to elect them to use their judgment, why don't we let them do it? So the policy of my office is where possible, and in Pennsylvania, it is very often possible, we do not pursue mandatories. Now, what does that mean in terms of sentencing? It does not mean that we necessarily want a sentence that is below what the mandatory would have been, right? So, for example, if you're looking at a gunpoint robbery in Pennsylvania, that would ordinarily be, or used to be, a five to ten year mandatory minimum sentence, right? There might be cases where that person should get ten to twenty years. There might be cases where that person should get one to, you know, one to whatever because that person isn't even holding the gun and is just standing over on the side. My point is not that we never seek a high sentence. We do seek high sentences where we think it's appropriate. My point is the mandatory is out of the way, and we make our recommendation, and we leave it to the judge, and we let the judges do what it is they are supposed to do, which is, which is use their judgment. Now, here's a good one. This got all kinds of commotion. Uh, one of our policies was that at sentencing, in addition to all the usual factors you're going to mention, that an assistant district attorney should also mention the cost of incarceration. Right? So if on average it costs 42000 bucks to have somebody in county jail for a year, then we're going to talk about that. You want six months because somebody slapped somebody, that may be totally appropriate. And you're going to tell the judge why it's worth spending $21,000 to do that. What I assume this would mean, and the reason we came up with it, is that on the, on the truly serious cases, it probably won't impact the sentence at all. Nobody is going to give a lesser sentence to a stranger rapist who's looking at 25 years, for example, nobody's going to give a lesser sentence because we know it costs over a million dollars. We all agree that that's probably worth it under certain circumstances in certain cases. The place where it's going to have an impact is where you have the mentally ill person who can't get proper treatment because we don't fund it, who's on his fifth retail theft and is walking out in the winter from some super fresh with five, you know, five different containers full of raw meat. And that person is supposed to be very bad for doing it five times and should do nine months. Really? You really want to spend $35,000 to keep somebody who's, uh, frankly, severely mentally ill, homeless, and is walking out of a store with that? Well, I don't. I think we have much better uses for the $35,000, including treatment, medication, and housing for that person. So that's what we were after. We were trying to make their BA conversation, make judges talk about what nine months means in terms of the public school teacher it could have been, or the new firefighter it could have been, or the drug treatment it could have been. That was controversial, and we're still pursuing it, and I'll let you know how it turns out. Um, so, you know, there's also, there are also reentry and mentoring programs that obviously can be very important. We've had some pretty good ones. But I think perhaps one of the most important things to look at is mass supervision. If you have not read the report by Vinnie Schiraldi from Columbia University about mass supervision, by which I mean probation and parole, please do. The worst state in the United States for excessive parole is Pennsylvania. The third worst state in the United States for excessive probation and parole is Pennsylvania. This partly has to do with the way the statutes are written in Pennsylvania. They do not allow a period of incarceration without having at least an equally long period of supervision. Um, but it has to do with a lot of other things, frankly, like judges who were afraid of abusive DAs who used to beat them up in the press. And so rather than give more jail time, they would give a whole lot more supervision time. And what does the science say about that? Well, what it says is that after three years, you're probably doing more harm than good. Because, and I'm sure you could probably figure this out intuitively, but it was a surprise to me, because what we see is that a lot of people will violate, will violate in the first year, and then there's a decreasing portion in the second year. By the third year, the number of violations is, is fairly low. And when we compare a group of people giving, su giving supervision for three years or less for the exact same charges with the same characteristics to those who are given three years or more for the exact same charges with the same characteristics, we find the ones failing more often are the ones with the longer supervision. Again, why? Well, it might just be that their employers got sick of their always having to report. It might just be that in year four, they started smoking some weed 
instead of taking opioids, which is a good thing. And when they had THC in their system, a judge who probably never had weed in his or her life thought that that was the same thing as cocaine and took them out of that job and out of that family and out of paying taxes and put them back in jail. That is what happens. So one of the things that we are looking to do in Philadelphia where, if I remember correctly, you break it down, it's about one out of eight men is under supervision, one out of eight men. It's like three times the national average. It's one out of 22 Philadelphians, but those are infants, those are young children, those are women who are much less prone to being involved in criminal activity or at least charged with it. One in eight men, I'm surprised I'm not under supervision, but if I was, I probably would fail it. Um, I mean, that's the reality. We have to do something about that. So one of the policies that we intend to come with is a presumption, and again, there are always exceptions to presumptions, and that's why we say presumption, but a presumption that ordinarily we don't seek more than three years of supervision. We don't do five to 10 years of custody plus five years of supervision after, and that has been the custom in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania forever. We have a fairly famous boxer in Pennsylvania called Bernard Hopkins. I don't know if any of you know him, but he was still winning title fights when he was about 50 years of age, and Bernard Hopkins, a product of our Philadelphia public schools, committed a crime when he was young. He did some time. Um, I think it was probably five or seven years, something like that. He walked off 25 years of supervision while he was not only becoming a repeat national boxing champion, but he was running a boxing production uh, organization with Oscar De La Hoya 25 years. Um, who did that serve? What was the purpose of that? He was doing just fine, and he was doing just fine for a very, very long time. So we need to rein that in. It, what it does, among other things, is it turns our probation and, and our parole officers into people who cannot possibly monitor the dangerous ones, the sex offenders, the ones they should be on, the ones who possess weapons, the ones who have been involved in serious crimes. How can they do that? They're spending all their time holding hands with people who didn't need more than six months supervision but are on 10 years of that kind of supervision. I will not get into the specifics, but there's been quite a bit of discussion around um, Meek Mill, a hip-hop artist. Maybe some of you have heard of him, but anyway, this is a guy who originally was sentenced to 11 and a half to 23 months for an offense, and because of a, a series of technical violations, meaning not new convictions, but things that presumably he should not have done, the judge kept ex extending his supervision until it was over 10 years. And based upon his most recent technical violations, which included things like popping a wheelie in a vehicle, the judge then gave him a sentence of two to four years in state custody for these technical violations. Now, he is not a perfect probationer or parolee. I'm not suggesting he is, nor should he be a uh, poster child for perfect conduct after you get out of custody. But that is the problem we are talking about. We are talking about periods of supervision that are so lengthy that you almost cannot help but fail, even if what you're doing is popping a wheelie. And haven't we all wanted to do that at some point, all right? All right, so I said a bunch of stuff. I mean, yeah, there's more to do. If you're actually even-handed in your appeals work, you might just say, oh, we're wrong. Okay, why don't we work out a guilty plea for a shorter period of time because we're wrong. If you have a, a post-conviction case where there's an allegation of ineffectiveness or that Brady material wasn't supplied that might have exculpated the defendant, you might just want to be even-handed and say, well, these nine times were right, but that time we're wrong. So what can we do? How can we work it out? And all that has a profound effect on levels of incarceration, even at the county level. There are other issues. There's commutation. There's pardon. There's expungement. There's compassionate release. Most of these are more prison issues than they are jail issues, but those issues are there. And every little bit of all these different issues has a profound effect on incarceration. Are there any questions? I would like to... Uh, I would like to warn and inform you that in the back is Officer Tom Kolenkevich, my security detail. <laughs> in a room full of journalists, it's always good if you, are, um, if you are a reluctant and recent public figure such as myself to have someone who is uh, armed and a good shot with you. And with that, I invite my journalistic friends to ask any questions. Let me start off maybe and say, well, what motivated you to go from defense, the law community, to become a DA? What, what, motivated, what motivated me was there was a, a herd of candidates who represented absolutely no change in the status quo 
And they were, as usual, beating their chests and stamping their feet to lock up more people. And it seemed like a really bad Marvel comic book that I just didn't want to see one more time at 57 years of age. I mean, that's really what it was. Um, I had been representing activists for a very, very long time, and Philadelphia has a strong network of activists. A lot of those activists, when they were young and scruffy, were one thing, and then, of course, they became chiefs of staff to city council people, or they became clergy, or they became uh, leaders in nonprofits, things of that sort. So I knew I had a little bit of political capital there, and when I started to check into it, it turned out I had more than I thought, and that built into something, and then I got a hint that there might be some outside financial support, which is a good thing when you've done a lot of free work for free speech. Um, and as it turned out, that was true. So, you know, I went into it not blind. I had a law practice that I enjoyed. We, I, was doing, uh, I was doing well and paying my bills and all that kind of stuff with the law practice. But I had enough hints that I would have more of a shot than the press realized that I figured I would probably lose, but it was worth a shot. Okay, questions. We have one over there. Hi, I'm Deborah Berry with USA Today. You, you brought up the prisons in the rural counties and you brought up the census issue. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know there's a big fight about where to count prisoners. Sure, where, I'm happy to. Yeah. Uh, and I think John Pfaff covers this really well in his book, Locked In, for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it. But the bottom line is, as I understand it, except for four states, the other 46 are going to count a person in the location where that person is incarcerated. So, for example, in Pennsylvania, we have Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia residents comprise about 27% of the state prison population, about 13,000 people. Those Philadelphia bodies will be counted as residents of Carbon County and Center County and Dauphin County and all these other places. What does that mean? Well, obviously, at one level, since there are no state prisons in Philadelphia, it's going to feed the local economy. There's that. But it also means that when you're talking about other types of government funding that are census-based, that that county is gaining funding that may be, you know, again, I don't claim to be an expert, but maybe it's highway funding. Or more importantly, maybe it's gerrymandering. Maybe it has to do with a level of political power, according to the residents of that particular location. There's kind of a sick but amusing anecdote on this point, which I'll mention briefly to you, but many years ago, I went all the way across the state to the western border to Greene County to try a case to a jury out there. There were only two judges in the county, <clears throat> and there had been a Ku Klux Klan rally at the courthouse shortly before because the sentence, census had come out for Greene County. Well, when the census came out for Greene County, it said that the population of people of color had gone up. It had. They stuck more people in jail. But the Ku Klux Klan was too dumb to know that that's what the report said, so they were outraged at this mysterious supposed influx among their neighbors and their homes of people of color. Well, it got that way for a reason. It got that way because Pennsylvania counts population in that fashion, and it creates a tremendous incentive on the part of state legislators in Pennsylvania to be in favor of fat mandatories, to be in favor of high and stupid sentencing guidelines, to be in favor of three strikes laws and things of that sort, because they are fed politically, they are fed financially, and they are fed even in terms of things like, let's just say, highway funds and things of that sort. I mean, I'd love to see it changing. The, the Pennsylvania legislator isn't really listening to people like me. They would probably like to see me kidnapped. Um, they're not wrong, but uh, do I see it changing? I mean, I think to the extent people actually vote, all of this can change. I can tell you this, which is a little bit encouraging. In Philadelphia, for three different DA election cycles, it's a low turnout cycle because of the timing, there were a, there's about a 12% turnout, meaning 12% of the vote actually came out in the election where my team ran. There was a 19% turnout. And the number of unexpected votes who turned out was more than Donald Trump's margin of victory statewide in Pennsylvania. That was from one city. So I think that to the extent you have voters who don't usually vote but are excited, or at least, or maybe terrified, um, you're going to see turnout in the same way that Donald Trump was able to, to animate uh, people, and frankly, including people like white supremacists who'd been hiding in the corners for a while. 
you saw that kind of turn out. But the same is true on the left. I mean, the fact is that, you know, Bernie Sanders, whatever you may think of him, he took the youth vote coast to coast among Democrats because young people were excited. Maybe it was just at the prospect of no student loans, and I can't blame them for that, but they were excited. So I think the reality is when you can get away from Democrats being Republican light, when you can get away from both parties suppressing the vote and running towards the middle, what you start to see is a big turnout, and with a big turnout, frankly, anything is possible in terms of criminal justice reform. You ain't getting it from the Supreme Court. I'm Samantha Perry with the Bluefield Daily Telegraph in Bluefield, West Virginia. Although we're on the West Virginia side of the state line, our circulation is actually equal in West Virginia and Virginia. And we have one state with determinate sentencing and one state with indeterminate sentencing. And we hear a lot of stories from law enforcement officers on the West Virginia side who will give an example of like a strong arm robbery in West Virginia in which the offender will then cross the state line into Virginia and write bad checks from the robbery. And they'll say that they go ahead and let the Virginia authorities have uh, the offender because they'll get more time for fraud in Virginia than they will, for, ultimately, they'll get more time for fraud in Virginia than for the strong arm robbery in, Virgi in West Virginia. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on indeterminate versus determinate sentencing. You know, I don't consider my, myself an expert on it. The, the way it works in Pennsylvania is you are required to get a sentence of X to 2X or X to 3X or X to 4X, but it cannot be just sort of like two years in jail, then you're done. Um, so you have a sort of a, a sentencing where if you got, let's just say, a one to two year sentence, you might, you might be paroled at one year, but then again, you might not. You might be paroled at 18 months. You might be paroled at two years. So I guess in that sense, it, it is somewhat indeterminate. Um, I mean, honestly, I think there should be less sentencing. I, when I hear law enforcement people saying it's terrible, they give less time over there. There's really two ways to go when you're talking about equality issues. One is treat everybody worse, and one is treat everybody better. And if the assumption is always that people should do more time because that's a good thing, and I'm not suggesting you're saying that at all, but if the assumption on the part of law enforcement is that it's always a good thing to do more time, then I guess that's how we got to be the most incarcerated country in the world. I mean, I guess that's how we got a higher rate of incarceration for people of color than South Africa had during apartheid. Um, I, you know, I think that probably both systems are workable, but they should be worked in the same direction, which is towards lower levels of incarceration. Hi, my name is Elena Schwartz. I'm a reporter for the Crime Report here at John Jay. And throughout today, in you know, not just with you, but in all of these panels, we've done some talking about how we handle low-level offenders, people convicted of misdemeanors, nonviolent offenses, and you know, the ways we divert them, how we shouldn't be holding them in jail pre-trial, and that's all well and good. I wonder whether you have any thoughts about the ways that we treat felons, violent offenders, people convicted of sex crimes, what are our obligations to people on the more extreme, I suppose, end of the criminal spectrum? So this is the topic that the left and progressives never want to talk about <clears throat> because this is a tough one. Young people are all in favor of legalizing weed. But as soon as you say violent, there's a certain visceral response. And yet the reality is if you're going to take a serious shot – at reducing levels of incarceration, you do have to address this issue. You know, the, the easiest and shortest look at this is what do you mean by a violent offense, all right? I, for example, about a decade ago uh, was attacked and I was cutting my face with a knife. It was a pretty good cut. It was like 20 stitches in and out. And yeah, I potentially could have bled to death and all kinds of bad stuff. My phone was robbed from me, blah, 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 right? This is a serious offense. Is it worth one year? Is it worth 20 years? Is it worth five years? Well, five years is $210,000. It's five public school teachers for a year we're not going to have. 10 years is twice that. 20 years is four times that. One year. One year is a long time to be in jail. I mean, I have, in fact, spent over a year of my life in jail because I had 10,000 plus clients over 25 years and I went to jails a lot. I don't like to be there. It's a really bad place to be. 
But somehow we got to the point where we thought, because we disconnected all of this from the discussion of where the assets might otherwise have gone, somehow we got to the point where one year just felt like five years because we're talking about M&Ms and Skittles. We're not talking about $210,000 or $420,000 and what that could have meant in terms of prevention in the long term. We have to confront this issue. Some of these violent offenses are not actually what we all sort of think about in this amorphous way. Some of them are two union guys who drank a bunch in a Philly bar and, uh, and have a bar fight and somebody loses one tooth, okay? So, or uh, somebody gets a, you know, a three-stitch cut on his forehead. Does anybody here really think that that person should lose their union job, stop being a support for their family, go to jail, we should spend 42,000 bucks on that, and that person should stop being a taxpayer. That is a violent offense. It is a violent offense that under Pennsylvania law caused serious bodily injury. I think that part is easy. That is the one that's easy, which is that ain't so bad. That's a not too violent offense. We should treat that differently. That shouldn't qualify for a lot of time. But I, as a victim of a more serious assault, having been slashed as I was, I can tell you as someone who had kind of had the shakes for a couple of years after that and had the types of effects that victims normally have of those things, um, I don't really think that my offender, the person who did that to me, and that person was never caught, so I don't know if there's a long record. The long record might change my view, right? But I don't really think it's worth all of you having to pay half a million bucks. I think that spending a year in jail is a significant amount of time. And I'm not persuaded that spending five years is going to make that person safer than spending a year if we could have taken some of those resources to fund the other four into dealing with the issues that drove it, which were probably addiction-related, and we're, you know, we're leading to what happened. That is, that is a person who should pay a price. But it, the price doesn't have to be much higher than every other country and so debilitating that we bank bankrupt our public schools in Philly, which we do. So, I mean, we have to wade in. The reality is we have to wade in, and we have to say, okay, 25 years sounds good. Do you know why it sounds good? Because it's a round number. Because you're talking about M&Ms. Is that really a better number than 10 years for a certain serious offense? Yes, there are some offenses where we should really more or less lock them up and throw away the key. We, none of us are going to tolerate stranger rape. None of us are going to tolerate serial murder. None of us want Charles Manson walking around, even if he's only been stopped for jaywalking. We're all going to do what we can to keep that person in custody forever. And there are many, many other examples of this. But just because it feels good in a newspaper article or it feels good at a visceral level to spend a million plus on a 25-year sentence doesn't necessarily mean that that was a better idea than a seven-year sentence or a five-year sentence or a sentence of 10 years. And there is a tremendous difference in terms of what resources we can put towards prevention between those two. So I think that that's the difficult conversation that we all have to have. And there's no question that by international standards, our sentencing for these offenses is through the roof. And there's also no questioning that by historic standards, if you look at what these offenses got 30, 35 years ago, there's no question that these offenses are, are these sentences are much, much longer. Hi, um, my name is Eric Hillary. I'm a freelance journalist based in New Mexico uh, in Santa Fe, which is a sanctuary city. Uh, my question is involving immigration. Um, you know, how are, how are you handling cases of immigrants moving through the criminal justice system? And, you know, what kind of issues does that bring up regarding local jails in your area? So, um, great question. The, Philly is also a sanctuary city. Every single candidate, no matter how law and order, uh, I guess is what they would call it. I actually think they were mostly about order, not law. But um, no matter where they claimed they were on the spectrum, all of them were pro-sanctuary city. Philly has, I think, the second largest immigrant population next to Los Angeles, so it's a big issue in Philadelphia. The mayor has also declared it a sanctuary city. One of the things we did is we started a unit within the DA's office, and it's only one person, but it is an immigration unit. So we took a, an immigration lawyer who understood the details of that, who had also been a public defender and therefore understood criminal law, brought that person in to do what they do in Brooklyn, which is they will look at cases they think are not so serious on the criminal end but have big consequences on the immigration end, and they will see whether there are equally serious but alternative charges that won't have this devastating immigration impact on a defendant, but are nonetheless of an equivalent severity so there's no discrimination against US citizens. And that is one way to do it. Some of these policies cannot help but put immigrants 
in a better place. For example, if you're really treating addiction as a medical condition and therefore you're not trying to convict people for possession of drugs, that has far-reaching helpful immigration effects, but it's also, without question, the right thing to do for U.S. citizens who are suffering from addiction issues, in my opinion. Um, so some of these policies in and of themselves are better for immigrants. The, you know, the other aspect of this is there are some discrete issues. One hot issue in Philly right now is access to PARS, P-A-R-S, which is a database that allows, among other, thing, among other things, ICE to access a field where a defendant has stated his or her country of origin access a field where a defendant has stated his or her social security number, and often what it is is a series of zeros because there is no social security number. Um, that is something that Philadelphia has been willing to do in the past when they were dealing with the Obama administration's already somewhat aggressive stance on immigration, but they weren't dealing with Donald Trump's, uh, frankly, over the top stance on, on immigration. I am not willing to do that anymore. And there are three of us who are signatories who make the decision. One is a representative of the courts, the other is the mayor, and I am the third. I am not willing to do that anymore um, because I have seen what it means. And what it means in terms of my job is that immigrants are not reporting that they are victims of gunpoint robberies. Immigrant women are not reporting that they are suffering domestic violence. And they're not doing it because our president has made it pretty clear that if they come to court, ICE may be waiting outside to get them as witnesses, to get them as victims, or to get their husbands as defendants. So the truth is that what has occurred based upon these Trumpian immigration policies is we have a category of people who have been designated as victims with targets on their back, who cannot get recourse from the DA's office or the courts for crimes committed against them or against their family, who cannot come forward to testify as witnesses when a US citizen is victimized, and I'm not going to be part of that. You know, I don't want to have sex workers getting strangled to death because they know as sex workers it's hard for them to come forward. We already have that problem, and we're trying to address it. I don't need another category of people, which is women and children who are undocumented aliens and cannot get any recourse for crimes committed against them. So frankly, what I can do to uh, push back and to resist what I consider to be a fascistic immigration policy is something that I will do. We have time for at least one more question. We got a, a bidder. Ah, got one. Hi, uh, my name's Tom Olson. I'm a reporter for the Duluth News Tribune, which is in northern Minnesota. Um, I'm just curious, we've seen um, county attorneys, as we call them in our state, or district attorneys, as we have across the border in Wisconsin. You know, we've seen some who have um, considered maybe less than tough on crime, who have been ousted in elections. I, I see you're coming in here in, in six months. You've um, put in kind of a lot of sweeping reforms. I, I'm just wondering what the community reaction has been to that, if um, that's something you felt you've had a lot of need to, to explain why you're approaching it this way and, and if you feel like you've gotten a lot of pushback on that or if people have been um, more receptive to some of these changes or, or just how you're having to kind of explain that to the community. Well, you know, I ran saying I was personally opposed to the death penalty. I ran saying I want to get people out of jail and I want to have job programs rather than longer periods of car incarceration. I ran saying I wanted to have an immigration unit that would do these things. So I am in many ways in a good position since I was attacked for all of these progressive agenda items that I had, I'm in a pretty good position doing exactly what I said I was gonna do. So, so, you know, I think the most candid answer is that the base is pretty happy and the people who didn't like it are tearing their hair out and they would like me kidnapped like most of our upstate DAs. Um, the local press has generally been real negative, not always, they're either real positive or they're real negative, as I said. I'm either, you know, the greatest thing that ever happened on day one or for the next seven days, I'll be the worst thing that ever happened. That's kind of where they are. And the national press has been um, very, very supportive and very interested. And, you know, even to the point where when we came out with what we thought was an internal document, this series of policies, and I've referred to some of those policies back in February, I came to learn later that in 33 different counties around the country, various activists were taking that four or five page list of policies. They were going to their local DAs, banging on the door and saying, we want to talk to you about this. Why aren't we doing these things here, right? I didn't orchestrate that. I didn't expect that. Frankly, I thought the stuff was too boring to interest people, um, but it happened. So the answer is, uh, you know, 
I guess maybe I'm a little like Jerry Lewis. They like me outside of the country. I guess that's kind of what it is. Um, <clears throat> except it's not the country. They like me in the rest of the country, and they're not so sure about me uh, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, you should know, is a very, very diverse city. It's about 40 45% black. It's about 40 45% white. And the remaining group are also of color. So um, it is a very, very diverse city. It's 7 to 1 Democratic. It, even though it wasn't a Bernie town, it was much more a Hillary town, it, it, by virtue of its, um, it, its demographics, and also, I would say, by virtue of a long sort of Quaker tradition, uh, abolitionist tradition, tradition of activism, it is perhaps more open to this than some other jurisdictions. It also has a high level of home ownership, and, a, and it's a relatively poor city for the 10 largest cities. So the economics, I think, are pro-populist. The demographics, I think, uh, play to the actual knowledge of people who've dealt with it, that one in three black men will experience jail in their lifetime. That's really meaningful to mothers and aunts and sisters who may not experience it themselves but have to deal with the consequences of that. So I do think that we're on, on more fertile soil in Philly to talk about a lot of these issues in a very progressive way. So they love me and they hate me. It just kind of depends on who you talk to. I have a question, and that is um, sort of in that vein. Um, I think you said it's the fourth largest police department, something like that. Yes. Um, so uh, w do you have a sense of the reaction of the rank and file to these um, changes that people who might see s sentences, convictions, as the, the rightful end to what they started with an arrest? Right. Uh, what's... Do you get a sense of the reaction from that corner? You know, I do get a, a sense of the reaction. And let me just ask you all a question for a minute. When you think about the rank and file police, did you just think of a white man? Because that's what most people think of. And you wouldn't be wrong that that's probably the largest segment of the Philadelphia police population. But it ain't the only segment. There's a very large contingent of officers of, of color. The Black Officer Association, which has been around since the 1960s, is known as the Guardians. Well, the FOP, in a city that only gave 15, 1-5% of its votes to Donald Trump, the FOP endorsed Donald Trump. That is a white-dominated bargaining unit that covers all officers. They endorsed Donald Trump. And then the Black Officers Association, the Guardians, went nuts, came out and endorsed Hillary, the Donald Trump FOP, Fraternal Order of Police, also endorsed a different candidate, the most conservative candidate for DA, and the black officers endorsed me in the general election. So it is a mistake to think of them as monolithic, to think of them as, as all feeling the same or having the same characteristics. I got a very, very warm reception from the Black Officers Association, which is probably... 30%, something like that. You know, I mean, when everybody is saying blue lives matter, which of course they do, a lot of those blue lives are black lives. That is true. And if you talk to black officers about their feelings, a lot of them feel like stop and frisk, and by that I mean illegal stop and frisk, is a bad thing because it happens to them and it happens to their kids and it happens over and over. And it makes them, their kids not want to follow in their mother or father's footsteps because it's so demeaning. So I guess what I'm getting at is that it's kind of hard to define the rank and file. I can tell you that, you know, this is Frank Rizzo's Philadelphia, and for those of you who don't know it, he was a cop who became police chief, who became the mayor, and in many ways defined um, a very, I hesitate to even say law and order because he didn't have much, much respect for the law, but it, it, it definitely defined a racist and brutal system of policing in Philadelphia at the time when he was both police commissioner and mayor. And that culture is still there because there's an awful lot of political power. So I can tell you that the conservative, white-dominated, we love Donald Trump, police union would like me kidnapped. And I can tell you that I think there's an awful lot of officers who are white and male and white and female and male and female of color who are really people of goodwill, who have some pretty modern and progressive attitudes, who are not crazy about arresting people just because of addiction or arresting people just because of mental illness, who don't think that infinite sentences are the way to go because they've lived in Philly their whole lives. They would like to see a more balanced approach. I think we're doing very well with a lot of that rank and file. And I also think that the reality is that the Philadelphia Police Department has at times been dominated, at least in its FOP leadership, by corrupt officers. 
And the ones who aren't corrupt are tired of not getting the promotions and not getting the overtime and not being appreciated for actually doing the job the right way. So I think that you know, with some of the less powerful people in the white-dominated union, we're actually pretty popular. I think with a lot of the attorneys of color, excuse me, the uh, officers of color, and I think also with a lot of the uh, women officers, we're actually quite popular. But that doesn't mean they can yell and scream about it, because they still have to deal with the leadership both in the station house and also in the union. Okay, I think, unfortunately, we have to stop the question now, but I think if anyone ever wanted, wanted to have candor and frankness in a keynote speaker, you more than super fulfilled expectations. Please destroy the video, if you will. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Krasner. I think, um, Mr. Krasner, will you be available um, for maybe five or ten minutes if anybody wants to um, catch you aside? Are you available if anybody wants to talk to you in the? Okay, so we'll break for about ten minutes and then we'll come back. <laughs>